This is a recording from the BC Humanist online event, Researching an Absence of Religion. Humanism is a progressive worldview that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. To learn more about humanism, to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Emily Fagan and I'm the Acting Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association and I'm very excited to bring you tonight's event which is in partnership with Non-Religion in a Complex Future. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that I live and work on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wissanik peoples whose historic relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here although I was not invited to do so. Um, and uh, just another quick note, uh, given tonight's turnout, everyone's mics have been muted. Um, you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions to our uh, host, Peter, at the end of the event, at which point I'll unmute mics. And uh, yeah, you can feel free to throw your questions in the chat if you have them so that we can jump right into questions at the end of like the presentation or just hold on to them until that point arrives. Um, and we are also recording this talk, so it'll be available on our podcast at a later time. Um, so yeah, without uh, further ado, I would like to hand things off to uh, Peter Beyer, uh, who will be leading tonight's event. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm trying to cut the glare on my glasses, but it's not working. Um, I noticed that Marty Shoemaker there is doing a real good job of that. I don't know what you're doing right, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge that there's a spy in our midst here. Uh, uh, Alicia Cummins is, is one of the people attending and uh, um, she and I work on this project together, right? Um, so um, I know um, that uh, uh, Emily asked at the beginning if any of our team members are going to be here. I thought maybe not, but obviously there is one. Um, so um, there are quite a lot of us on this on this research project, so it's not really all that surprising that a, a few people should make it. Um, anyway, uh, as I said, welcome. Um, uh, I'm going to try to um, talk about this research project that we're doing um, in a fairly comprehensible way, uh, but um, it's, uh, it's called uh, Non-Religion in a Complex Future. Uh, and I'd like to point out that the word complex is in there. Uh, which um, uh, is there for a reason, and as as um, as, as I will uh, demonstrate in uh, what I have to say about this. So um, I will I will use a PowerPoint slide just to you know so you, you all have something to follow along on. I know those some th those things sometimes get in the way more than they help, but I'll I'll take the risk that, that that's not going to happen here. And so I will uh, put on my screen share and. You let me know, I take it, you can see that. Yes? Yep, looks good, Peter. Okay, all right. All right, if this is a, a multi-year uh, research project uh, on non-religion, um, and I'll have lots to say about what that might be. Um, and it's, uh, it's centered at, uh, at uh, my university, University of Ottawa. It's under the overall direction of Laurie Beeman. Uh, and my colleague, and uh, we're funded uh, about as generously as it gets in Canada uh, by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Um, so uh, we, it's as I'll explain, it's it's a multi-year project involves quite a lot of people, and it uh, involves seven different countries, uh, and we have nine co-investigators. So it's 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 not as large as some teams have been, uh, but uh, it's fairly large. And that's because we are trying to undertake this project in a very multi-pronged way. So let me start by uh, perhaps giving you an idea about why on earth are we doing this? Um, and uh, as much research um, is the case with much research, uh, this is uh, brought on by things that are happening in the world that um, we thought that it would be good to try to understand better. And one of the, the big symptoms, as it were, of this uh, changing happening in the world is what um, we generally refer to as the rise of the nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S. 
uh, which refers to the fact that in virtually every Western country, at least, um, the percentage of people who, when you ask them what their religion is, say none, uh, has in the last couple of decades, especially, increased uh, significantly to the point where some countries um, like um, United Kingdom, for instance, that uh, depending how you point ask the question, it's over 50% of the population. Uh, you folks, I imagine that virtually most of you are in British Columbia, and you probably know well that that's um, I, um, you know the, the, the land of the nuns, uh, where the percentage of the population that is of um, that kind of an identification uh, is 35% uh, overall, and the Vancouver area, it's uh, over 50%. So um, that, that's a pattern that's happening uh, across the, as I say, the Western world. Um, including uh, notably in the United States, where um, the percentage of people who claim no religious affiliation has gone from 15, 16% to about uh, over 20% within a decade. Um, so, you know, that what we used to know the United States as this uh, big exception where people are generally really quite religious, that that seems to be less and less the case, and not just uh, uh, in Northwestern United States. Uh, in that other part of the territory that's often called Cascadia. So that's one aspect. So one of the things, what is going on here? And above all, I mean, who are these people, right? Um, who are the nuns? What are they doing? Um, uh, why did they get to be that way? Um, and what are they now? Uh, and uh, initially, of course, the only thing that we know about them is that what they're not, right? They say, when you ask them the religion question, they say, I don't have a religious identity. I don't uh, follow a religion or anything like that. Um, but what they do do um, is uh, not so much of a mystery, but it's a, a very, very complex situation because uh, we cannot assume, of course, that all those people who put that kind of an answer on a survey question um, uh, are, as it were, doing the same thing. The other thing that's, um, that's part of the background is that um, we seem to be living in a time worldwide where there is increasing uh, contestation and sometimes even conflict, conflict surrounding this difference between religion and, for Kenyan's sake, we call it non-religion, um, various things like there are still a lot of countries in the world where uh, being an atheist, for instance, or a not religious person can be dangerous. Um, uh, there are places in the world where being a religious person can be relatively dangerous, uh, such as, for instance, in the People's Republic of China. Um, there are various areas of contestation in most countries, such as, for instance, Canada. Um, you may uh, know about and remember what's been happening in Quebec lately with their, um, their law that forbids people from covering their faces. Well, that was before COVID, obviously. Um, and uh, that they recently took the crucifix off the wall of the National Assembly. I mean, this is a contested, contested issue. Uh, and there are quite a lot of those things around. In the United States, it is still the case that uh, it may be the case that you can get elected dog, get, get elect dog catcher now if you're an, an atheist or a professed atheist. Uh, but uh, forget it if you want to be governor or, or let alone president. So there's still a very, very different situation. Uh, in other parts, like in Latin America, it's um, the situation is really quite different. There, there doesn't seem to be this phenomenon happening near to the same extent, and yet uh, it it is also there. On top of that, uh, most of the evidence that we have suggests that this trend that I've been talking about is likely to continue over the next little while because um, the research that research has been done has shown that this has actually been going on for quite some time. And it's only very recently that we've noticed that this is an ongoing trend um, away from religious identification and on to whatever else that is. So that's the context. Now, um, this research project, um, I say it's complex, but uh, it's also um, tries to be relatively focused in what we're trying to do. So I've listed here the, these are the five things that we told the social sciences and humanities research council that we're going to do. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate mostly on the first two, which is why they're highlighted. 
and that is we're trying to develop new research tools to measure and describe non-religion, including trying to figure out what that is. Uh, and then the second one is to expand the conceptualization and theorizing of diversity to include non-religion, which indicates that uh, we're operating on the assumption that whatever non-religion is, it is itself really quite diverse uh, and cannot be, you know, the, the non-religion is a, as I'll say later, it's, 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 a, it's a term that's a placeholder. You know, we need some kind of a word that we use to talk about what we're talking about. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it is really no uh, more than that. It doesn't really uh, have any particular content other than what it isn't. Now, our, I should say that the project, um, uh, unfortunately, um, although it's a multi-year project and we've been going for about, well, it's getting close to two years now, um, one thing that's happened, of course, is that COVID has got mightily gotten in the way of, uh, of trying to uh, carry out research. Um, uh, but the other thing, too, is that we've had to spend quite a long time um, sitting down and figuring it out what it is that we're trying to do here um, and uh, figure out ways to do that. So um, the to pursue those research questions that I introduced in the last slide, uh, we have some challenges that we've been facing and we've, we've been working on them, which is a way of saying is that we don't actually have any solid research results yet. Uh, so what I'm talking about today is what it is that we're trying to do uh, as opposed to what it is that we found doing it. Uh, that will have to be for another time. So the challenges, uh, I've tried to outline them here. Um, what does it mean for a person, a society, a, a social institution, to be non-religious. What does that mean? Right? We know what it doesn't mean, uh, or at least we think we do, um, but we don't know um, um, more than about that. Uh, second, another way of putting this, what is non-religion non -religion besides what it isn't, namely religion? Now, there are attempts to kind of get at this and sort of compare it and say, well, maybe people are doing a different kind of thing that's sort of religious, uh, call it an ersatz religion, a quasi-religion, a pseudo-religion. There's a whole literature on invisible religion, on implicit religion, and things like that. So um, religion that isn't religion, but sort of resembles it, right? That's one uh, way that this uh, question um, has been answered in the past. Uh, and then we have a bunch of um, what I call them cognate terms. Um, uh, I'm sure you've all heard people who say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not, not, but I'm not religious. Um, where the question is immediately, what does that mean, right? Um, and then people are willing to tell you and they have ways of expressing that, but that's one way of looking at it. People are moving towards more being more spiritual rather than being religious, whatever that means. Or um, there is this idea about cultural religion, um, that uh, people aren't religious anymore. They actually don't adhere to a religion, uh, but culturally they are maybe Muslim or Christian or or, or Hindu or something like that, um, but not religiously. Again, the question begs itself, what, is, what exactly does that mean? Uh, then we, there's all other words we try to say, well, I don't wanna use the word religion uh, because that's too specific, so I'll use something broader. Uh, and some of those things is worldview, um, a, world, a word that I've become very suspicious of because it doesn't really solve the problem anymore than calling it non-religion. And then we talk about identity, um, that's another word. And then this, sometimes quite politicized word about values, you know, do they share our values? Um, is that what non-religion is all about? Um, a, a set of values? Well, so I put that in a question mark. All that to say that uh, non-religion is a placeholder. And one of the tasks that we've uh, been tackling in this project is to be um, really much more clear uh, or find out ways of being much more clear about what this non-religion is. Uh, uh, Laurie Beeman and I have, um, when we were a number of years ago talking about this project for the first time, we used um, the analogy of dark matter from physics, right? Uh, non-religion is kind of like dark matter. Uh, it is a huge amount of what's out there, but it's difficult to see. Um, uh, and uh, therefore what we're looking for is something that is relatively difficult to see, at least using the tools that we've used thus far. 
So that's um, a way of looking at the challenges that the, the, the research questions uh, uh, are facing. So how do we go about this? How do we identify what and who we're talking about? Uh, one of the ways that, uh, that, uh, that has come back again and again when you try to do this is that whatever non-religion is, you have to figure out how it's related to religion because that's the way you're identifying it. It doesn't mean that non-religion is a kind of religion, uh, but it has to bear some relationship to it that can identify it as that, which it isn't, which is religion. Now, one of the problems behind that is that, um, and this has been going on for a long time, what's religion? Um, that's not an answer, a question that has a, uh, a, a very, very clear answer, although uh, most of us go about in our lives having a pretty good idea about, you know, what we mean by religion. Um, uh, so, well, what's religion? Well, you know, it's what they do in churches and synagogues and, uh, you know, private prayer at home and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, so we have an idea what religion, but it's, you know, in order to figure out what non-religion is, uh, we would have to be actually a little bit more precise so that we can figure out what that relationship is. Now, uh, there are a bunch of labels out there which help us along our way. And one of them is, identifies um, your organization or the organization that is hosting this event. Uh, and that is uh, a, a non-religious person can be a humanist. Um, I don't think I have to throw into the mix as well, what exactly is that anyways? Uh, because I'm sure that um, um, the members of the association have had long discussions about that and will continue to do so. But there are others. Uh, atheists, I've mentioned a couple of times, um, uh, not all non-religious people are atheists, but some of them are. Um, there are people who call themselves free thinkers as a way of labeling themselves and giving us an idea what this non-religion might be. There's that um, contested word secular, right? Uh, it's sort of like, what's secular? Well, it's not religious, right? But what is it really, right? Uh, agnostic is another one, rationalist is another, and I'm sure there are others as well. Um, all these things are understood to be, they are what they are, but they're also identified as being not religion or at least not religious. And what we're after in this project is uh, precisely that positive content. Um, we don't, we don't want to know more about what this isn't. We want to know what it is um, and how it presents itself, what effect it has, et cetera. Um, we also get at this relation thing uh, in other kinds of ways, what I'm calling here the sort of of the but nots, right? The, the, the one that I already mentioned, the one that is, is fairly common these days is the spiritual but not or spiritual more than religious. There's the cultural religious one, and then there is the word, the idea of indifference. Um, ask people, so what about religion? Eh, I don't care, you know. I don't even think about that, right? Sort of that indifference. And then there's the marginals, right? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I guess you know. I guess the family I grew up up in, you could call it Christian or Jewish or something like that. But uh, but you know, that's sort of a little minor part of my life, and. Um, doesn't really occupy much of an important spot. So you got that sort of relationship that going on in there as well. So this is kind of the, this is all by kind of to kind of set the context uh, of what it is that this research project is trying to go about. Now, let me tell you a little bit about, you know, the structure. Um, uh, obviously we, it, it's, it's, it's not only a large question, it's a question that can be addressed in on a whole bunch of ways uh, and in a whole bunch of places. Uh, it could also be addressed in a whole bunch of times, but we're not doing a lot of history in this particular project, although we could. So um, through, for practical reasons um, and others, uh, uh, the uh, research project is being carried out in seven different countries, or at least seven different regions, uh, Canada, Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Argentina, and we grouped the Nordic countries, the four Nordic countries all together. Uh, and that is the seventh site where this is taking place. Now you can see that um, uh, this group of countries is fairly selective because uh, we wanted to be careful that we had areas that were comp at least 
potentially comparable. Uh, it would have been very, very interesting, of course, to bring something like China or Korea or India into this. Uh, but the way thing, the way religion works in those parts of the world is so different that non-religion is going to be something rather different as well. And therefore, you'd have to develop entirely different research tools and approaches in order to be able to study this question effectively there. But you could. So for practical purposes, we essentially have uh, narrowed it down to these Western countries, uh, but made sure to add in something that wasn't um, standard Western European, North American, Australasian, which is why we got Brazil and Argentina involved in this. And uh, you may well know Brazil and Argentina are really rather different places. Uh, so it's not just variations on theme, much like uh, Canada, Australia, the United States are really quite different places. Uh, in order to get a little bit of a handle on this, we've also uh, narrowed it down to what we call focal research areas uh, and places where we're going to look um, to study non-religion. Uh, and these are, as is listed here, in the area of education, uh, in the area of migration, you know, non-religion and migration, um, uh, which is an important thing in Canada, the United States, Australia, and, and, and much of Europe. Um, health, uh, you know, in the larger sense of that word, um, the environment, uh, ecology, that kind of stuff, uh, and in the law. So it's, it's not that we could have, we could have chosen different areas, but, you know, for, for practical reasons about where the expertise of the team lies and these kinds of things, uh, these are the ones that we chose. For instance, <clears throat> I have a, a relatively long history of uh, researching uh, religion and migration. So it's kind of natural to move over to non-religion and migration. Uh, my colleague, Lori Beeman is a specialist in, in law. And so that's a logical place for her. Uh, we have uh, people like Solange Lefebvre in, uh, in Montreal and Linda Woodhead in the UK who specialize in education among other things, et cetera. So these are the, the areas. And I mentioned these is because uh, when I get, which is the, the, the bulk of the talk that I want to give here, when I get to the areas of describing some of the actual research that we're doing, uh, which I, you know, I hope that I can introduce some interesting factors there, uh, that uh, they're going to concentrate on these, uh, these five areas, or shall we say, be located in these areas, looking um, at researching non-religion in terms of these research areas. So, um, one of the challenges is uh, to actually translate these ideas and these questions into real research projects that generate usable information and knowledge. Right? So um, some of the things we've th thought about or in, are in the process of doing uh, in the area of health. Uh, we're particularly interested in death and dying. So, I mean, I, I can't talk about all the projects. Um, there are quite a few of them. So we've got a project where we're trying to get at uh, the place of non-religion in palliative care. Um, uh, uh, many of you have had the experience, I know I have, of being in a situation where a loved one is in palliative care and the atmosphere there is, you know, if you're in a hospital or in a hospice or something like that, all of a sudden religion is far more present than it would be in an ordinary hospital ward. Uh, and then in that particular situation, I says, well, what, what do the non-religious people do? How, you know, how, how are they, how are, how are they treated? Uh, what, what kind of services uh, and what needs do they have? How do they experience this? Um, and there are other kinds of areas that we're looking in there as well. In environment and, and health, we also have a number of projects going. I'm gonna talk briefly about two of them. One is on trekking, hiking, walking. Uh, and the other one is on community gardens. So I don't know if any of you are hikers. Uh, I know in BC, that's uh, something that one does a lot. Um, and um, uh, maybe some of you are also involved in gardening. Um, and we're looking particularly at community gardens as opposed to you know the garden I have in my, my, my backyard and that you may have as well. So that's an area. Um, in the area of, of migration, we're looking at specifically non-religious migrants, like for instance, um, migrants who come to Canada, say, or refugees who come to Canada from Syria. Remember, we uh, not so long ago admitted somewhat 80,000 Syrian refugees. Um, and um, uh, 
most of those Syrian refugees are going to be have strong religious identities, uh, usually mostly Muslim, but a, a fair number of Christians as well. But then there's going to be the people who don't. So how do they make this experience of migrating as refugees to Canada when we know, for instance, that 75 percent of the sponsoring organizations uh, that help these refugees are, in fact, religious organizations or associated with religious uh, institutions? Um, how are these migrants, uh, you know, can you be a non-religious migrant in that kind of atmosphere? Uh, and, and what does that mean? Um, so that's what migrant reception means. So that there's another area where we're, we're, we're getting going on some interesting things. Um, uh, it's none of these things is as easy to research as one might think. Uh, so it often takes quite a long time to figure out exactly what to do. Uh, that has a hope of being um, successful um, rather than just doing it. And another thing we're, going to, we're doing is uh, we've created a survey with which we're trying, going to try to measure non-religion. And I'm going to be talking about uh, that a fair bit in the remaining time that I have, which I don't know what it is, um, uh, because that's the one that I'm in charge of. So I know most about it. So I figured I would talk about that. I'll talk a little bit about the trekking in Huni Gardens as an intro to some of the issues that we're facing. Uh, and then I'll spend, as I said, the remainder of my time talking about this survey to measure non-religion. And what I'm hoping is that, um, well, maybe I'm, I'm hoping that maybe some of you will end up taking the survey, but uh, um, uh, we, sh we shall see. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, the rationale, how we went about doing this, and introduce you to some sample questions of the kind of things that we think have some success of actually measuring this dark thing that we're calling non-religion. So um, I'm gonna have to move this. Okay. Two research projects, they're in the area of environment, but they kind of cross over into health as well. You know, it's, it's healthy to go hiking and trekking. It's healthy to eat uh, food that you grow yourself in your own community garden, et cetera. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of environmental issues involved there as well. So one of the ones, um, the people who are running this have entitled it trekking toward all, right? Non-religion and hiking. It examines how people understand the relationship to each other, nature and non-human animals uh, through hiking, trekking, walking, rambling as an entry point. So it's a way of trying to get at it. Uh, like other projects, um, it is designed, uh, and this is, this is actually very hard to do. It is designed to get away from like religion. Um, in other words, looking at these things as if they were religious substitutes or like religion. This is exactly what we want to get away from in order to try to understand um, these realities in our society, um, uh, perhaps with religion in, in the back of our minds, uh, but not as anything uh, that is actually religioid or religious. So that's, that's the challenge. The project asks, what sort of experiences do people have while they are trekking? And how do they make sense of them? Um, do they even have such experiences? I mean, we're perfectly open for people saying, look, I just go and walk and I enjoy it, right? There's not much more to it. But others will, you know, probably tell us tales about, about you know, having uh, fantastic experiences that changed their lives or at least gradually reoriented their their uh, relationship to nature, to the world, to themselves, etc. How has trekking shaped what people actually do in terms of environmental behaviors? You know, has it made you more of an environmental activist? Um, does it reinforce uh, something that you're already involved in? Um, does it make you more aware of, of, of the situation that we, uh, that environmentally we are living in, uh, in the world today? Does trekking change a person's outlook on what is important in life? Um, in other words, what effect does it have on people's actual behavior? Uh, and how does it make sense, uh, uh, help to make sense of the lives of the people who are engaged in it? Now, the methods that we're, that we're using, and I'm gonna have a lot to talk about, you know, how to actually change, translate these questions into actual research methods. Uh, that's a particular uh, challenging area. Um, the people who are doing this, uh, they have developed a survey 
right? We do that a lot, right? A survey where they can ask about attitudes, behaviors, experiences while trekking in the light of trekking. And they will undoubtedly also go to clubs that do trekking and interview people and maybe do some participant observation to see what goes on. Um, especially since, um, unsurprisingly, we have about, um, we have at least three people on the team of nine co-investigators who are avid hikers. Um, and uh, we'll regularly say, no, I can't come to that meeting because I'm uh, trying to climb a mountain. So the American fellow we have on here, uh, he is, I think he's almost done. He has climbed to the highest point in every state of the union. I don't think he's quite made Mount McKinley yet. Um, that would be the biggest challenge. Um, but uh, I think he's, he's done Washington and Oregon and uh, you know the ones with the big peaks, um, I think. But he's working on it, right? Uh, but I should also say he's he's really quite a young man, so uh, he's uh, he's he's physically able to do this. And we have the fellow down in Tasmania. He's also he's a, he's begged off meetings, saying sorry, I'm going to go be hiking there. And our uh, co I in uh, in in Norway, uh, she's you know she's all over the place: Jordan, Central Asia, um, you know, um, Northern Africa. You know, going on bicycle trips and you know trekking through the wilderness and 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 through through all sorts of territory. So it's something that uh, that a lot of us can relate to directly. Uh, and I should say also say that um, uh, I would say that a disproportionately large number of the people who are on this research are themselves non-religious. So um, you know it's kind of there's a bit of an insider thing going on here as well. But not all of us. You know there we have some quite uh, honestly religious people on the team as well. Quite a few of them in fact. Now um, the other one community gardens choose these pictures again. Um, here, the purpose is to explore the social and ecological relationships created by community gardens. That's what, it's a community thing. One of the things that we're really focused in on is how, um, you know, how whatever non-religion is manifests itself in people's social relationships. That's, you know, through the idea of community. Um, um, and, uh, and this is one particular one that starts right there by looking at that aspect of social relationship and how people relate to one another in these particular contexts here in the context of community gardens. How do people link their gardening to how they think about and interact with nature? Again, it's similar to the trekking. Um, here we, um, they, you know, I know they are thinking of a, an, a survey, but uh, this is going to be mostly kind of uh, going to gardens and talking to the people who are involved in them, uh, interview with key stakeholders um, uh, and asking people who are actually involved and maybe getting involved oneself and seeing what actually goes on here. Uh, so, you know, the questions are, what role does nature play in shaping these relationships? Um, where did the gardens come from? What is their history? Uh, what are the kind of relationships have established that? Do they have relationships with other institutions like religious institutions, food banks, municipal authorities, et cetera? Um, and at the moment, this project is um, still trying to figure out which gardens they're going to do in which countries. Apparently, it's not as simple as it seems. Uh, there isn't just community gardens. There's a whole variety of them, and they take all sorts of shapes, sizes, and structures. And so um, uh, we're having to do a fair amount of work to make sure that we get it right and that we uh, get a representative sample of such gardens in the various countries that we're doing this in. So there's a lot of organization planning that has to get done. And the community garden ones is uh, still at that stage. So as I say, we're only trying to finalize and pick the gardens. So that's uh, a couple of projects that are different than the one I'm gonna talk about mostly, which is the, um, the measuring non-religion survey. Again here, what we're trying to do is do it positively, not what it isn't, but what it is. Um, uh, what is its content? So, uh, you say a non-religious person can tell you that they're not religious, uh, but then you want to say, "Well, you're not religious." Well, what do you do? How do you run your life? Um, how do you view the world? Um, how do you do your non-religion? When you try to translate this into a survey, you have an immediate problem: is as well, what questions are you going to ask people? other than, you know, are you religious or not? We're certainly gonna do that, but we don't wanna ask them positive questions. So um, um, 
the way we've tried to do this is to pick areas where we might find interesting things. And we've used the uh, four research focal areas or the five research focal areas to try, help to try to structure that. So um, uh, we have a, a number of uh, approaches here. One is we want to measure value orientation. It's a kind of a really broad term, um, uh, which I will give you some examples of, but uh, you know, it sort of uh, it measures the degree. Well, one of the things it measures is the degree to which you're non-religious, right? But uh, uh, much more thing, uh, things like, for instance, as the second line, what's your, what's your ethical perspective? You know, what's your morality? Uh, where does it come from? Um, how do you perceive that? How do you live that, right? Um, again, the questions of social relationships. Um, um, in, in the literature on, on religion, there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff on how religion provides network community, a place to, to identify, a place to be. And so we said, well, non-religious people aren't going to have that. Um, they're going to have something else. So uh, we're, we're, we're thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's community gardens. Maybe it's trekking. Maybe it's the BC Humanist Association. Maybe it's a whole bunch of other stuff, but we want to try to find out. Then we have the particular questions that, that we've tried to devise with the five different areas in mind, namely environment, migration, law, health, and education. What kind of questions can we ask in relationship to that to try to get at the positive content of whatever this might be? Certainly, we're going to have to ask questions about the people's attitude towards religion, because that's also part of it. Um, uh, it's not the main thing we're after, but what you want us is how do you relate to religion? positively or negatively. And of course, we have to ask the demographic questions, age, uh, um, gender, sex, um, uh, socioeconomic status, all, you know, education, all these kinds of things. Uh, and then there's a very particular sort of questions is that the, what we call the sorting questions. Are we going to classify people as religious or non-religious in terms of this survey? Uh, and interestingly enough, those questions are actually going to be at the end. Um, because, you know, we're not mainly interested in that. We're interested in uh, people's, the way people put their, their selves together um, uh, in various areas of their life. Sorry, I just spilled some water on my computer. Okay, considerations in formulating the questions. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, how do these questions, oops, how do these questions measure non-religion, considering that we don't quite know what that is? Now, uh, um, we've adopted two conceptual strategies, which you might call tricks to try to get it. One is to take a page from religion, but to not use religion to do it. In, uh, in religious studies, which is the discipline that um, I've spent most of my academic career in, sociology is the other one, um, we often talk about the components of religion as the four C's, code, cult, community, and creed. Code is ethical code, cult is the ritual, community is the collective part, and creed is what people believe. So, you know, Christians believe that Jesus is God, uh, they go to church, um, they uh, attend mass or whatever, the, or read their Bible, uh, and uh, they have a strong sense of what their religion tells them is right and wrong, okay? So uh, the idea is the non-religion would have parallels to these dimensions. So moral and ethical orientations that are non-religious, behaviors, uh, which, are, uh, which express the non-religion, uh, but they're not necessarily rituals. They could be, but um, they, they might be. Senses of belonging and relationships, they would be there as well. And of course, this broad area of attitudes and values. So that's one way of looking at it, uh, kind of components that we're looking for. However, all this without religious assumptions, like looking for a substitute for transcendence, sacrality, uh, or what I like to call nine biolo non-biological actors, God, spirits, ghosts, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's, that's sort of excluded from the scene 
because otherwise that would uh, suck us back into the religion vortex. Uh, the other idea is to look at whatever non-religion is as um, a personal or collective, uh, one way of putting it, a system of life regulation. How do you run your life? Um, or what is your worldview? What is your identity? Worldview and identity are two words that try to get at that same kind of idea. Who am I? What should I do? And with whom? What is it good? What is it good to strive for? What is what is it uh, good to avoid? What is it? What is bad? Uh, with whom do I associate? Why? Uh, why is that important? Uh, and what does that make of me as a human being? All those questions uh, are you know try to assume under assume under this this idea of life regulation, uh, in other words, uh, worldview or identity. Okay, now that's to give you kind of the background. Um, now, keep an eye on the time here. Yes, it's about right. Um, so here are some, this is to give you an idea of the actual questions we're gonna ask. So this is sort of saying, how did we end up actually translating all this abstract stuff I've been talking about into real questions? And then what I'm hoping is that you guys can um, look at these questions and ask yourselves, um, how would I answer that? Does the, is the answer important, right? Uh, for who I am, right? As um, a, relig a non-religious or, you know, if the case may be a religious person. So, uh, we have sorting questions and we do this a number of ways. You don't just say, uh, what is your religion? And you say none, you're in. That's one of the ways we do it. Uh, but we do it other ways too. For instance, uh, we ask people, how religious do you think you are? Just your subjective opinion, right? Uh, whatever you mean by that, uh, where do you fit? And then we have the typical kind of, you know, five scale answer, uh, not at all religious, all the way to very religious with uh, three options in between. Uh, and then, of course, what you do is you take that identification and then correlate it with the answers to the other questions to figure out who the non-religious uh, are. Another way is to do it much more, more positively, uh, and that is to look at these uh, alternatives that I mentioned before. Um, uh, you know, the list is, is, can be larger than this, but we decided on these six to try to get at it. You know, do you consider yourself to be an atheist, an agnostic, a humanist? a free thinker, a rationalist, or simply just not religious. And of course, this one has check all that apply because people can be more than one thing. So those are a couple of questions we have about, we have the one about, you know, what's your religion, right? That, that one's there too. But there are about three or four of these things to try to sort out uh, who are gonna count as non-religious people in terms of this survey. Then we have, as I said, the attitude toward religion ones. Um, uh, and these are, basically questions for people who, um, uh, who are non-religious, right? So you know, we wouldn't ask this um, uh, for people who say they're religious because as you can say by the, uh, see by the, well, the second one, you know, you might have some religious people who think this way, but uh, generally not. So uh, a lot of these questions are on this, on this scale thing from strongly disagree to strongly, dis uh, strongly disagree to strongly agree. And I'm sure all of us have done lots of these surveys asking these kinds of questions using these scales and is always the cop you know the opt-out answers is, i don't know i can't choose among them right so uh, most of the questions that i'll present to you are actually of this type um do you agree with the statement right uh yes or no um then so we have religion is good for those who believe in it but it's not for me well we'll see uh that's almost a sorting question but it's uh, you know it's also an attitude question uh religion is bad and only leads to violent hatred, prejudice, and delusion. Now, we're not assuming that non-religious people are gonna answer strongly agree with this one. Um, they may well not, but we do want to know how they relate to this kind of a question. So those are attitude to religion. There's, there's, there's about, in each one of these things, there are uh, from three to five questions that try to measure a particular sub area. Uh, and there are about five of these things. Education sample questions. Again, from strongly disagree to strongly agree, um, students in public schools should learn about a wide range of religions and other non-religious worldviews. Do you agree or not? I think the public school curriculum should promote a secular scientific worldview. 
Yeah, another attitudinal kind of thing. Now, one of the um, things that I should mention is we've tried to construct this survey so that we might possibly find non-religion among religious people, right? It's not excluded. Um, so there's an awful lot of these questions that we will ask anybody whether they've identified as relig religious or not, because we want to know what what uh, uh, what their orientation is, their you know their tendency towards behaviors on, on all these kinds of issues, and then try to relate that to um, their degree of uh, religiousness or not. Value orientate. Now, there's lots of these. That's why I've given three because there's uh, there's a there's a whole there's a bunch of scales actually that we're using that we've uh, taken from the social psychologists. Um, uh, but um, here I've just um, picked a few to give you a kind of a, a little taste of the kind of stuff where I, I should say there are the, the questionnaire we have at the right right now has 95 questions, um, and um, we've had a test pre tested. And it take, apparently takes 25 minutes to do this thing, right? So it's not too uh, demanding, but still fairly amount, fair amount of time. So uh, there are things that cannot be grasped by the natural sciences. Uh, that's kind of an orientation towards uh, uh, the natural sciences, uh, towards you know how understandable life is, etc. Um, another one would be, I would accept limitations to my standard of living if it alleviated other people's suffering. This is the caring dimension, right? Um, and uh, here we, this one is an example of a behavioral question. People, what's something people uh, do or would do in this particular case? Uh, and then this kind of um, sense of belonging into, in, in the world uh, with a question that is, I feel part of a bigger whole. And here, I mean, as I say, ask yourself, I mean, how would, I know how I would answer these kinds of questions. Um, how would you answer one of these questions? And uh, uh, what do you think that might tell researchers such as myself uh, about, about you. Morals and ethics sam sample questions. Well, here uh, we've got, we don't have too many of these, but these are scenario questions. So, you know, you get kind of tired of these uh, scale answers, right? So every now and again, we throw in a question that has got a bit more substance to that, right? So um, uh, I'll just, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to read these questions rather than me reading them out. Yeah, I I I I, um, I, I use Charles as a, as an example because he I could tell what he was reading so that when he's finished, then uh, I'm using that as the um, as the measure. So you see, we, we've given you kind of a scenario, and then um, um, it's sort of like um, what's your attitude towards the decision of these people uh, in these scenarios, and um, what what do you think they they should do, right? So it's, these are kind of moral and ethical question samples. Social relationship ones are, again, you know, the scales make it relatively straightforward. Um, and um, uh, here, these particular social relationship questions ask about um, the importance of family and friends. How important are these relationships? And, you know, to what degree would you, uh, are you engaged with them 
Uh, so as in the second question, I will go out of my way to be there for family and friends, right? Um, so it's not just that, you know, they're family and friends, you get together with them every now and again. Uh, it's, it's more than that. You actually have a sort of a commitment uh, to help them when they're in need, et cetera. Environmental samples. So here's a behavioral one. I'm willing to accept cuts to my standard of living in order to protect the environment, right? Um, that's a, it's a value orientation, but it's also like a, 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 an ability to measure the degree of people's behavior, at least the, their potential behavior, uh, should it come to that. Uh, and then, you know, a kind of a standard question about global warming and climate change. Um, you know, do you think it's a problem? Um, how concerned are you? Uh, there, as I said, there are more questions in each of these subgroups, but these are a couple of samples. Law ones. Um, this actually uh, uh, does a, a, a um, kind of a, a, a take on on the crucifix in the, on the wall of the National Assembly, asking people if they are, find it acceptable that religious images and symbols be displayed in public buildings, such as schools, municipal council chambers, and legislative assemblies. Um, uh, what's your attitude to that? Do you agree with that uh, or you don't? And then uh, one that's almost a flip side of that is, I think religious communities should have the right to rule on matters pertaining to family law outside of the state's legal system. Um, uh, I know that um, in Ontario back in 2007, we had, I think it was 2007, we had an incident um, where uh, about, um, it was called um, faith-based arbitration, right? Uh, Ontario had passed a law in 1991, basically allowing people to undergo uh, arbitration, you know, uh, with an arbiter uh, using religious law as a basis, as long as they all agreed to do that, right? Uh, and then around 9, 2007, um, um, somebody found out about it, shall we say, to make it simple. Uh, and then it was a big public issue. And to make a long story short, uh, the government of the time absolutely squashed this possibility, um, saying, no, this can't happen. So, um, you know, we asked the question, well, what's your attitude towards that kind of a question? Then the migration ones. Um, this, these ones um, are, the first two uh, are, Questions that we'd only ask of people who have migrated or whose families have migrated relatively recently. Uh, if you of your parents are non-religious, was it easier to be open about this in your country of origin or in Canada? Right. So if you, for instance, uh, an, an atheist from Pakistan, right, is it easier being an atheist here or was it easier in Pakistan? Right. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then the second one uh, in Canada, obviously, depending on what country this is in, it would be changed. People make assumptions about my religiosity based on my name, country of origin, or appearance, whether I'm religious or not. So that's that question about um, do non-religious people get received in particular kinds of ways uh, when they come into the country? And then a question for everybody. And here we've tried to be um, pretty kind of, you know, really punch right at it. Uh, and what he says is, I think we should limit newcomers coming from Muslim countries. Well, what do you think about that, right? Uh, and so... It's, it's not a question about what do you think about immigration policy and stuff like that. It's one that gets directly at, at you know, what it often is really all about. It's about Muslims. Um, so those are the migration questions. And the last ones, I think this is the last uh, uh, um, thing, uh, slide, health sample questions. So uh, again, uh, just to give you a, a little bit of an idea of the variety and the kinds of questions we're asking, uh, my health is mostly determined by my own behavior and chosen lifestyle. In other words, your health is under your, largely under your control, and you can do something about it. Uh, and secondly, um, a question that I particularly find interesting is uh, people's attitudes attitudes towards GMOs. Uh, genetically modified foods are very dangerous developments and should be stopped. What's your attitude towards that? Um, that is a question that, uh, one of those questions that really, as, as well as any other, crosses the religion, non-religion divide in interesting ways. And uh, we would be interested in finding out what the pattern of answers is to uh, a question like that. Okay, that's it. I think I've said enough. Uh, I was supposed, I was trying, trying to do this in 45 minutes and I went a little bit over, uh, but not too much. So why don't I just stop there and um, 
give you guys a chance to talk. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, we really appreciate such like a in-depth presentation on this. Um, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Uh, either, yeah, you should just uh, let us know in the chat if you have any questions and I'll unmute you so you can ask them. Um, also, Peter, where can people find the survey? Can we link that maybe? Uh, no, it's not public yet. Okay. Um, uh, I'm in the process of getting um, uh, research ethics approval to launch it. Um, and um, um, then we will, we will make it broadly available. We're gonna, two, we're gonna be two, using two techniques. First, we're gonna do what I call the social media blitz. We're gonna get this out um, to um, as many people as we can on social media. We've done this before. Alicia, who is present, she's a, she's a master at doing this kind of stuff. Uh, getting, getting the word out, out on social media and then the people who are interested come and take the survey. You know, we give them a, a survey monkey link and uh, off they go to the survey and they fill it out, um, you know, give their consent and fill it out and all that kind of stuff. Um, but we're still, these kinds of things is um, tell them they can email you that way you, we can promote our other project. <laughs> Ever the practical. Uh, uh, Alicia is, is, is a researcher's dream uh, in terms of somebody to work with. Uh, she was my, my doctoral student um, for more years than she cares uh, to mention. Um, and she recently uh, successfully defended her thesis. So congratulations to Alicia. Uh, and uh, as of 1st of April, she's going to start a one-year postdoc not on this project, um, but on another one that I'm doing. Um, and that's the one she wanted me to bug you about. So yes, actually I can do that. If you send me an email uh, and Emily can, uh, uh, Emily, right? Yeah, Emily, yeah, I'll yeah. pop that in the chat for yeah, everyone. Yeah, and well, yeah. your social media as well, I assume everyone should follow if they're not already. Uh, well, if you give us, if, if you send us the email, yeah, the, the social media, we, we haven't actually set that up yet, right? Um, we have to do that yet. Uh, we have it for the other project because we're actively, re we've been actively recruiting for over a year on that one. Uh, it's not an entirely different theme, um, but, uh, but we have yet to do that. Um, oh yes, there is my email right there uh, in, uh, from Ian Bushfield. Uh, so if you send me an email, I'll send you a copy of the, of the, I mean, it's not a secret, a copy of the questionnaire as it stands right now. Um, the, um, the tracking people also have a questionnaire, but they still want to hold it close to the chest uh, because I don't, I, th I don't think they're really quite done uh, formulating it. We have a version. We, we came to a point where we have to, we, we came to the uh, Fisher cut bait point um, and was, okay, we've been working on this. I mean, we we're working on it for about six months putting the survey together. And so finally we said, okay, now we're going to, we're going to test it. We're going to launch it out there. And then uh, actual people are going to tell us whether it works or not and how it works. So that's the stage that we're at. And then we're also going to get uh, one of the polling firms that have panel data or panels uh, to uh, launch it on a representative basis across probably about five countries. Um, and um, uh, that way we can get a more representative sample. And uh, 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 we're hoping that we can do that for a relatively affordable amount. Mm -hmm, that's a smart plan. So we have a question from Paul. I'm just going to uh, unmute him so we can ask. Yeah, so I'm just wondering um, how your team looks at um, the people who have beliefs in supernatural beings or forces, um, whether they're considered religious, non-religious, or on a scale. Uh, I find as I talk to people, many people have this belief, even if they say they're non-religious. Um, so do you consider that non-religious, even if, if people say they're non-religious, but they still believe in supernatural forces? Yeah, well, we're, we're, not, we're not deciding that. We let them decide whether they're non-religious or not. Um, uh, because if we tried to uh, uh, you know, impose our own criteria there, it would just be far too arbitrary and uncontrolled. So if, you know, it's for, who counts as non-religious here is the people who say they are, right? In terms of the sorting questions. However, we ask everybody questions about the kinds of things you're talking about. Um, I didn't put it on my samples, but there's a one, it's got about, um, I don't know, 10 items on it uh, about, uh, you know, things like um, extrasensory perception, ghosts, uh, 
um, uh, uh, what's some of the other, do you believe in souls, right? Um, uh, do you believe in any kind of a God spirits or anything like that? Uh, uh, we have a whole bunch of questions like that. And we also have a question, uh, as I indicated about, about, you know, these kinds of extraordinary experiences. Um, uh, we, you know, we're interested in, for instance, people, people who have had near death experiences. Uh, we know that uh, a, a certain percentage of people who've had near-death experiences come out of it with, you know, these fantastic experiences that they had while they were in the in the process, right? So we want to know people who had that. What do then? What? How do they answer all those other questions, right? So, um, and indeed, in the sorting questions, we have a way of we don't just ask people whether religious. We ask also ask them whether they think they're spiritual. And so we have a way of getting the actual, the classic spiritual, but not religious or spiritual more than religious. And then we want to see to what degree they answer these questions about these kind of standard bank of non-traditional belief items. Um, uh, and one of the ones we have in there is, is uh, a cosmic force or energy like chi, you know, that one's in there. Um, I can't remember them all, but there were a few. We we had to be a little bit selective, obviously, because you can't you know can't list up 20, 30 items. Uh, but that stuff is definitely there, and we're we're very interested how there is this cross between. Um, I came across a talk recently about from someone who was doing what were they? They were researching some kind of a non-religious organization, um, and she was trying to figure out what kind of rituals people in these organizations, so to say in the BC Humanist Association, when you meet, do you, do you engage in non-religious rituals, right? Uh, so the, the group that she was in, some of them did, right? And some, some of the members of this who were, I mean, they were, well, the equivalent of atheists, right? Um, they really got a lot out of these rituals and a whole bunch of other people says, nah, I don't like that stuff at all, right? So even that that's that variety of, of how one is non-religious, um, that, that diversity, because we know that um, just because somebody says, the answer is a question like, are you religious? And they say, no, not at all. That, that tells us very little about them. Um, and uh, precisely the aim of this, um, this survey is to as broadly as possible, figure out how they put their world together. Again, if you if you send me an email, I'll send you the questionnaire, and then you can see which one of these items we were actually asking. So our next question is from Susan. I'm just going to ask her to unmute. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I was thinking about um, when you say religion. I'm I'm not part of a religion. You're thinking about the institution. Is there any way where you make this separation because they believe that religion is institutionalized, but they still believe in God? Mm -hmm. um, they oh, just yeah. don't go to the different ritual practices. Because some of the things that you're explaining was uh, about the, um, the components of religion. And that could be, you know, brought over into a sports team or a political organization. They all can be brought down with the, the sense of belonging, community, yeah. and all of that. So when you think of religion, you think of it as it being an institution. I find that that's why people kind of separate themselves because they don't like the institution called religion, but they still call themselves spiritualist. And how do you compare that with the higher consciousness community? Well, uh, we, we try to get at uh, all that variety. Uh, obviously, we, we, when we, people say that they're non-religious or they don't belong to religion, well, we just accept that, right? That's, that's, that, that's the answer to that question. Um, but then we ask them other sorts of questions where they can uh, say, well, no, I'm not religious. Uh, I don't belong to a religion, but I, I do these sorts of things. Um, I meditate. I actually pray, right? Uh, every now and again. Uh, or even often, right? So one allows that kind of a combination um, where people don't want to put themselves in one category, but they, as it were, want to put together elements from 
things that sometimes belong in those categories, or at least a lot of people think they belong in those categories, and put them together in their own way. Uh, and if they were, and, and, and often they will say, well, that's not religion. Religion is that institutional stuff where they tell you how to run your life and where you go every Sunday or every Friday, every Saturday, uh, and, 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 and engage in, in these kinds of practices. I don't like any of that kind of stuff. However, this is what I do. And I especially avoid the word instead. All right, our next question is from Marty. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Emily, for, uh, for hosting this and for helping and uh, for Peter, you being a part of uh, our humanist association here. Uh, my, my issue is that I've been reading a lot about the research, people like you and Edward Slingerland and Thiessen and Lafamme did in their recent book that came out, none of the above that I just bought. It, we're getting lots of really interest in, yeah, there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, a couple of Canadian researchers, which is great. Yeah. And so, and you know, uh, Edward by Sling. The way, by the way, just let me interrupt you. Both Joel and Sarah are on the team. Yeah, I thought <laughs> they might be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. So, uh, what, one of the things that's of interest to me is the parallel, because all the seven countries that you have we can easily predict that the non-religious uh, sector is increasing because all the countries you picked are some of the most secular, except for the United States, uh, some of the most secular in the world. So my question is, has anybody been having the opportunity to research some of the countries that have traditionally not been religious and are actually religion is growing in some of those countries like Russia and China uh, where they're allowing certain denominations and and you know a very structured way and the Orthodox Church of course in the Ukraine and and in Russia has been growing is anybody researching uh, the contrast of those identities? and our way of looking at this non-religious sec sec sector that we have in our Western democracies. Is anybody doing that research? Well, I, I, it's, it depends on precisely what you mean here. There's certainly tons of research on religion, say, in Russia. Uh, uh, there is actually a fair amount on religion in China, even though that, for political reasons, is really hard to carry out. Um, what there, uh, what there is probably a dearth of is precisely, perhaps that's what you're, you're pointing at, is uh, what we're calling here non-religion in those countries, right? Now, the, the one way that, I, that we are trying to get at that, uh, and it's actually uh, a part of the migration sub-project that I talked about before, is I really want to have a close look at the people from those parts of the countries who come to Canada, right? Uh, especially the East Asians, uh, because we know the, the Koreans are a bit of an exception because they tend to pre-select so that 70 to 80% of them of people from Korea who come to Canada are already Christians, whereas only about uh, 25 to 30% of the Korean population is. Uh, but in places, and, and Japan is also an interesting case, but we don't get a lot of immigrants from Japan these days. Uh, our Japanese uh, uh, ethnic population has been here for, you know, generations for the most part. Uh, but the Chinese, of course, especially from the PRC, are a huge source of immigration. Uh, and they arrive in the country, the uh, first time they fill out the census, they say, no religion, right? And I personally have done some research on what they mean by that. I would like to uh, find out much more about their, how do um, Chinese immigrants do their non-religiousness once they get here? Um, but I'd like to do that. I don't know of anybody who actually does that in, in China. Um, 
there may be indirect ways of getting that, um, you know, how people view themselves in the context of a, of, of, of a country that's run by the Chinese Communist Party and where there's, there's a very, very strong ideology that is, that is, uh, um, that is taught and, and, and spread uh, within that country, um, a high degree of, of, of nationalism and things like that. Um, so there are re things researched on that, but not uh, with the particular kinds of questions in mind that we are addressing. And I repeat, we chose those countries deliberately so that they would, that the contrast would be manageable, right? And even so, uh, I've, 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 I've gotten so used to our uh, co-researcher from, uh, from Brazil saying, no, sorry, that doesn't work in Brazil. It doesn't work like that here, right? Um, uh, and so even with those seven countries we have, we have this, what you might call outlier that is difficult to, because you wanna do these research projects in every one of the countries. And it's difficult when one says, no, you can't do that here, right? It's not gonna work, right? <laughs> So our second to last question comes from a different Paul this time. I'll just ask him to unmute. Paul, can you hear us? I think I unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can hear you. Oh, good. Thank you. I want to ask if you're going to do any uh, neurological examinations to assess brain function in religious and non-religious people. We don't have they anyone in the team the who's capable of doing that. Uh, that would be that that would be a wonderful project. Um, I mean, there there have been projects that um, do this kind of brain function stuff, you know, fMRIs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of religion, you know, what do people do? What, what happens in the brain when people meditate and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and um, um, uh, I, I would love to be able to do that. I mean, the, this project doesn't do that. We, it, it never was designed to do that. I mean, uh, mind you, maybe we should because uh, getting money from the, uh, uh, from the, uh, the, the, the health sciences division of the, of the funding agencies you get an awful lot more money than you could do for social sciences and humanities, but um, but I don't know of anybody who is actually doing that kind of research at uh, in that discipline and on that level. But as I say, um, I would love somebody to do that. What did you say, Marty? Can't hear you. You're mute. You're muted. Oh, Marty, I'll unmute him. Oh, you have to unmute him. Okay. <laughs> Big trouble unmuting him. I've asked him to unmute. Uh, hopefully, he sees the alert. I was going to say that there's a group at Caltech, uh, and there's also Sam Harris has been doing that kind of research with some of his neuropsychology friends, you know, and uh, uh, the uh, skeptics group has been pulling that stuff together uh, in some of their publications. Okay. Uh, yeah, that Sam Harris should be doing this is not surprising, given yeah. where he comes from. Yeah. 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 All right. I think uh, we're going to move on to our last question from Tegan then. Does that work? Okay, it did. I, I had a question and then I had two. The first one, I guess, was in under, really, really interesting talk. So I guess you're you're not making definitions and sorting people necessarily, but you're trying to understand how people define themselves non-religiously. Yeah, we, we, let, we let the people determine whether they think they're non-religious and we take their word for it. And you're studying sort of what that means to them? Well, we're studying what that means to them and we're also studying, you know, like I say, we're trying to go for the positive stuff. So, you know, what do you do? What do you think? What is your attitude? Uh, how do you make meaning out of your life and all that kind of stuff? Um, uh, we are asking that of everyone. And then we're, what, what we want to see is what kind of patterns of answers we get from people who say they're non-religious compared to people who say they're religious. Right. Yeah, that's why I say that 
there's a bit of a, almost an, an irony or contradiction in that we are also, I remember the first time I raised this, <laughs> um, uh, you know, the idea of searching for non-religion among the religious, right? Uh, one of my colleagues said, my head just exploded. <laughs> um, but that's also, I mean, this, this, again, I get to that dark matter meta metaphor, right? It's, it's there everywhere, but you can't uh, see it using the tools that we standardly use, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and, uh, and so, yes, um, we're looking for this kind of stuff among religious people as well. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and that's why, you know, we have yet to see, we're, 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 we're really interested in what the results are going to be. Um, and uh, we, by the way, are not the only ones who are doing research like this. It's, um, it's gotten to be a bit of a cottage industry over the past 10 years. Um, and there are, I know of at least four groups around the world, around the Western world, who are, who are working on, well, sometimes it's called unbelief, sometimes it's called non-religion, sometimes it's got irreligion. There's different kinds of words for it. Or secularity. There's some people in Leipzig in Germany who are doing a secularity project. Um, and I mean, and we all know each other, right? But um, um, uh, it, it, it's a much broader thing. But so far, it's it, it really it's it's the whole research area is in its it, it is in its beginnings, uh, and and for the reasons that I just mentioned, this is not so straightforward how to go about doing this. I imagine it wouldn't be. Second one was I guess on the countries that you sort of mentioned. We think of the Western world and the Eastern world. I was wondering about the differences you notice potentially between, I guess, the North and your two South American countries. Constant. It stood out to me as different from the other five. Yeah, yeah. It's always a constant challenge to translate our research impulses from the, well, well, I, I'm going to say the Northern countries, but, you know, there's Australia. <laughs> um, but it sort of is, you know, it's another British settler society, so it kind of belongs in the same group. Um, uh, and you know the the Argentinians and the um, I remember when we put this uh, this survey together that I talked so much about. Uh, we have uh, Hugo Rabia is is the representative uh, researcher from from Argentina who's on on that project. And you know I, I saw every, in every second third question he says, well you know the question works in Argentina, but nobody would understand those answers. We'd have to have different kinds of answers, right? So this is constant difference. Quite aside from the Braz from the Brazilians. They say, uh, I'm not sure whether we have this here in Brazil, right? And they say, well, we think you do, but let's work on it and see how we how we can how we can conceptualize this and 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 translate it in a way that would work as well as possible or in a parallel way in the Brazilian context, which is quite clearly different. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, and it's clear different enough from Argentina, uh, and certainly different from the other uh, five uh, countries and areas. Neat. Thank you. I think we're just going to take our last question from Ellen. Uh, so go ahead, Ellen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. That was very interesting. I've taken copious notes. Very interesting. And I'll look forward to seeing the result of your survey in the future. Um, my question is, perhaps the non-religious are no different than anyone else, except that they aren't religious. Perhaps their values and most of their beliefs except on the supernatural, are no different than the religious. Will your survey be able to detect this? That's precisely what we're after. Yeah, because you know that 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 is a that is a what we say a plausible working hypothesis. What you've just said, uh, and we're out to test it. Right. Um, uh, it reminds me of you know that cartoon that was floating around uh, a number of years ago. What will happen if gays marry, right? And the answer is gays will marry. <laughs> so it might be something very, very similar, um, but we're not uh, judging that issue at all. Um, we we want to find out. Um, and uh, um, social science research, like any research, is just the really fun part about it is the surprises. And, you know, you know, the data comes in and says, whoa. That's not what we expected, right? And that actually makes the whole thing fun. It's it's all right to confirm your suspicions. And say, okay, we thought that would be the case, and it is, right? But after a while, that gets kind of boring. It's the surprises that you really want. All 
All right. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I think that's all of our questions, but thank you again, Peter, so much for giving such a really important and insightful presentation. Um, for anyone who wants to find you, uh, we have the social media uh, information for non-religion and a complex future in the chat. Uh, so make sure to check that out. Yeah, um, yeah, Peter's and, email and, and, is also in the chat. Yeah, you can, uh, you can also contact the NCF people, right? Uh, we have a website. Uh, uh, with which, by the way, the website has uh, little descriptions of all the projects uh, as well, and, and including the ones that I talked about and and uh, several more, uh, as well as it gives you a constant in, uh, update. Well, what it is that we're doing, right? Um, so if you want to keep track of where we are in our research and what we're what we're doing, and you know, once uh, the COVID pandemic is more or less over, uh, what events we're going to be hosting and things like it. Right now, our events are all like this, right? Um, like you, I have had my fill of Zoom meetings. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Marty asks, what's the website called? Um, hang on a second. I will give you the URL. Oh, someone just posted it. Perfect. Um, okay. So well, see. I guess you can find it in the chat. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed this talk. It's the last talk in our spring series because uh, I am leaving the BCHA at the end of next week. Um, so I hope you guys all enjoyed. And if you wanna see future talks, um, definitely email myself or uh, Ian when he comes back from paternity leave at the end of next week with um, what you would like to see in the future. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Have Been a good fun. rest of your night, everyone. Okay, bye now. <laughs>